That's where the loose lips uh, are very prevalent. So, you know, I, I thought that was sort of funny. <laughs> I'm looking through these things, and I, I, I found it mentioned in three different three different uh, documents. So, okay, so if you happen to be in a foreign country and visiting a house of ill repute, uh, I want to keep that in mind. <laughs> How about the, uh, the, the technology they were using? I'm talking about from the end of World War II to about 91, when the Soviet Union sort of folded up in on itself. So that was the era when all of this stuff went on. And what were they trying to do? You know, any way you can get a, any way you can get a bug into things. One of the first things is to repurpose in-place equipment. You know, somebody's got a floor lamp in the office or in the conference room. Hey, figure out how to get a bug in there. Uh, present a gift, and I've got a couple of examples of gifts that turned out to be. Uh, some Trojan horses. Uh, another way, if you want to get something inside of a building, uh, maybe you can use a contractor to install equipment, service equipment, and uh, authorized equipment in there. If he happens to, you know, drop a microphone in a piece of this equipment, hey, you know, so much the better for you. You know who the, the most famous contractors are? Xerox. Hmm? Xerox. Xerox? Well, not, this is not contractors I'm thinking of. The contractors I'm thinking of is guys who, who have more than one reason for being there. Uh, telephone? Yeah, how, yeah, telephone is one of them, but they, the most, the well, most well-known is uh, a group that were trying to bug the uh, Watergate Hotel. That's what they, they were considered, they considered as contractors for, uh, well, for, for a sitting president, really, but. Housekeeping? Yeah, yes. housekeeping is another good one. That's one of the, the problems I run into, and in a lot of the research, I found out that that was how a lot of people got into <coughs> some place. They didn't have to be technical people. You know, give them a microphone, and a radio transmitter attached, and a piece of bubble gum, and stick it underneath a table somewhere, or put it up in a in a ceiling lamp. So they, you know, contractors, other people, other than your your truly authorized people, uh, they could get access. And a lot of these people like housekeeping. Normally, when does housekeeping come in? You know, they don't run around during the day when all the other people are there. They're in there at two o'clock in the morning. You know, dusting everything off, washing the floors, digging through the mail or the waste baskets, and your inbox, outbox. Uh, another technology was to build bugs into the actual infrastructure of the building. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these neat bugs that they come up with. You know, we think of a microphone or something like this. These uh, there were other systems that were used that uh, most of us wouldn't even think of as a microphone, but it did a good job. And the best ones they had were the ones that were hidden in plain sight. If you had something that, you know, sitting right here, a computer, a computer monitor or something that was in plain sight and was considered as part of the hardware in the, in the room or part of the furnishings in the room, why, hey, good deal. Let that, let that thing sit there. You know. So are you saying IT was a, a way of getting into? Mm -hmm. IT was, was one, of the, one of the big ways of getting into it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about telephones and some of the, you know, because telephone was one of the most, uh, it almost was invisible unless you needed to make a call. 
You know, he expected the phone to be sitting on the guy's desk. He expected the phone to be in the conference room. Pay phones in the hall. So it was, you know, everybody remember pay phones? <laughs> I saw one the other day. They're still there. <laughs> a couple. The best way to, to hide a bug is to hide it in plain sight. And actually the most famous bug hidden in plain sight was the Great Seal of the United States. It was actually a large wooden uh, carved wooden <coughs> great seal that was given to the U.S. ambassador by, the, by a, a group of Soviet children. You know, you're not going to expect kids to be spies, at least not back in that era. So this was given to him by children. I think they probably had quite a bit of adult supervision on their project. <laughs> This thing actually sat in the ambassador's lounge for seven years, from 1946 to 1952. And the only reason it was ever discovered was that uh, British and U.S. <coughs> monitoring stations, you know, they got them all over the world, they're sitting there tuned across the band. All of a sudden, uh, in the case of the British one, he saw the, or heard the British uh, military attaché talking to the ambassador. <coughs> uh, he knew that wasn't right. <laughs> and uh, the U.S. heard the ambassador talking to somebody else on another frequency. So, and by the way, they, they both reported this incident up the chain of command, and it evaporated into some big bucket somewhere. Although I guess they didn't have bit buckets then. It's more like the died a natural death folder. You know, if you get something you don't want to do, don't know what to do with it, or don't want to deal with it, you put it in a, a folder, set it over here, and wait, and if nobody calls around for, for a couple of months, it's died a natural death. And this one was a passive device that was powered by a strong external RF source uh, feeding uh, what was referred to as a resonant cavity microphone. It's another one of those things you wouldn't think of as a microphone. What it is is a, is a microwave cavity with a small antenna connected to it. And if you hit it with enough RF, it's going to uh, retransmit the si any signal that hits it. And on a, as a side note on this, uh, both the United States and Russia complained to each other about the very high levels of RF being radiated in the direction of their embassies. So why would they be radiating the embassy with RF unless it's <coughs> to either power a piece of equipment or to pick up a signal by using the RF to, to uh, drive something else. So did you find out what we planted in Moscow? Uh, actually, that was, there were uh, other measures taken. I, I will talk about a little bit later about a system that was used in, uh, against the, the Soviets uh, it wasn't in Moscow, but it was tapping telephone lines. You, a couple of things. Uh, do you know what frequency was being used? And also, I think this was designed by Theremin. Did they use it originally? Theremin was one of the people involved in designing this type of microphone. Do you know what frequency it was? Uh, 320, 320 megahertz originally. Then they went to 250 megahertz for some reason. And the third iteration was 1.5 gigahertz which back in, in the 1940s and the 1950s, that, that was really getting up there for, as far as 
creating enough RF power and aiming it at the, at the station. Nice looking U.S. seal, isn't it? I mean, these kids must have been very talented to make this. And that was hanging on the wall right, right behind the ambassador's uh, desk in the lounge. And it was actually, it was actually discovered or, or finally found by a Dutchman. And it turns out uh, the CIA and the Dutch had a very close relationship on espionage. The Dutch built a lot of the equipment that was being used to counter espionage, as well as they built a lot of the actual bugs that were sewn into the upholstery of chairs, uh, cast in concrete walls, you know, other funny things. Anyhow, this Dutchman went in there. They were trying to find out what was going on because they knew there was a signal. They could see that there was a signal being transmitted, but they couldn't find out where it was coming from. And this guy, I guess, during the course of this, literally ripped this thing off the wall and pried it open with a big knife and found a microphone powered by high power RF aimed directly into this guy's office. So that's a, that microphone is one of the resonant cavities that they fired a signal at and generated enough power to transmit a signal back out to their uh, monitoring station. Since this was in Moscow, I'm sure it was right next door in the luxury room. Another one that Moscow, that the Russians did, the Soviets did, they actually bugged the building when it was being constructed. The U.S. Uh, in 1952 started no negotiating uh, to build a new U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Well, the, well, as it turned out, according to international agreements, if you want to build an embassy in another country, you're supposed to use their people to build the building. More local contractors. Uh, what they did is they actually cast these concrete pillars to build the building with bugs inside of them. And they actually put them in a is metal, uh, metal unit is a contact microphone that would pick up signals of anybody talking anywhere near these pillars. So they, they encased that in a piece of wood and cast it right into the concrete. And were, they said more than 40 were found. They didn't say whether they busted up every pillar to, to do this, but I mean, if they put 40 of them in there, I'm sure there's another 400 of them did somewhere else. And they ended up tearing the building completely down, including the outside brickwork. Because the brickwork was another thing that had to be installed by the local contractors. And then renegotiated the contract, or the, the agreement between the US and Russia to allow US people to come in and build the building. Part of the deal, though, was uh, they only allowed, they, the negotiated number was 50 workers and three supervisors to build this, this huge building. So they literally tore everything down. I, mean, I guess they were x-raying things and everything else. I, when I was 
looking up stuff like this. Has anybody ever looked on archive.org? You, you have, man, there's all kinds of stuff. A whole bunch of uh, CIA documents that were declassified after 50 years. And if you've ever heard the term heavily redacted, uh, these, these have been declassified, but uh, there's a whole lot of pages that had maybe one sentence or part of a sentence that was visible. The rest of it was all covered up. But it's an interesting place to go look up, look up things. Uh, at least I found it to be interesting. And it cost the U.S. government $240 million to rebuild that building. And it wasn't actually completed until after the Soviet Union uh, dissolved, when they actually, the, the head of the KGB gave a complete set of blueprints to the United States after the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. And they actually, he gave them a set of blueprints that showed where every one of those bugs was. <laughs> In the, in the old building. Oh, the one they tore down. Yeah, the one they tore down. But up until the day he handed them the documents, the blueprints, they had denied that there was even one bug in that building. <laughs> it was all built to both U.S. and Soviet standards. So I thought it was sort of funny. Here they give this, give this guy a set of blueprints and then go, Oh yeah, by the way, we, yeah, we really did put bugs in there. Bill? Yeah, I was just going to say, some years ago, my wife and I toured Tallinn in Estonia. And there's a big Russian building, typical Russian. And the local natives said it was made out of microcrete. <laughs> it has so many microphones in it. <laughs> microcrete. That's the Russian version of concrete. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know I, I visited East Berlin on a tour one time that was there was a building in East Berlin that was right at about two blocks from the checkpoint Charlie and the part of our briefing before we went over there they said that uh, that you should look your best when you go over there because there's at least 100 cameras in that building aimed at you plus some guns hmm? plus some guns hmm? Well, yeah, there was always guns aimed at you when you were in East Berlin. When I was when I was stationed in Berlin, we went in. The, when I was stationed in Berlin, I was, one time it was Checkpoint Charlie, and there was a U.S. tank with the barrel exactly one foot behind the white line that was drawn across the road. Barrel aimed towards East Berlin. The other side, there was a Russian tank <laughs> with its barrel. One foot behind the line, and I, I saw them do this. They went out with a plumb bob and put it on the end of the barrel and measured to make sure it was truly inside the American sector and truly inside the Russian sector, which is East Berlin. So it's like, yeah, really, that's the ultimate. Uh, one of them fires, you know, both of them are dead. But anyhow, I thought it was sort of funny because they're sitting there like that while diplomats were in a building that was actually fit over the line so they could talk back and forth through a glass window, a piece of glass. Strange happenings. And here's another one. This is something the Americans did. They, in, in, in uh, conjunction with their friends, the British, MI6, they created a project called Operation Gold. And what they did is they dug a tunnel <coughs> under, uh, about, I said the top of the tunnel was about two meters down, about six feet down, dug it. Under it, this was before the wall went up, so it was just the dividing line was, you know, 
it's out there. Trust me, if you step on that other piece of grass, you're going to be arrested type of deal. And they spent two years digging a tunnel because they had the blueprints for the telephone system in Germany before the war. So the Americans and the British had these things. So they go out there and they dig a tunnel over there because they know there's a long distance telephone cable right over there. Dug up underneath and they used what's called the capacitive tap. Hooked up to every one of those telephone lines. And they were able to intercept over 400,000 telephone calls. Some of them evidently very high level. Uh, and that was a six and a half million dollar thing. I have actually seen part of that tunnel that's in a museum in Berlin. They've got a 21 foot long section of it that's on display at the uh, Allied Museum in Berlin. Uh, but they screwed up in one way. They cut the sheath off this telephone cable and they were smart enough to put a strap across there so people would know that there's not a, uh, there's not a, uh, a break in the cable. And they had a very light capacitive coupling, but they didn't waterproof anything. Well, in 1956 they had a very wet spring. Two things happened. They had an awful lot of telephone line outages. And using their test equipment, the, East, the, the Russians and East Germans said, oh, the problem on all of these lines is right here at this one spot. Uh, the other problem was that they had, they, they had actually known about this at high levels for years because there was in MI6 there was a mole. I can't remember his name right now, but the guy was and he was passing every bit of information to the Soviet Union. So at the high levels they were well aware. But at the lower intermediate levels they didn't tell anybody. You know, it's like, you know, let's keep a secret here. It would seem to me that if you're in a position where you know about espionage, that you're going to do something about it. You can tell people. I think that in the 1950s, there'd be voice scrambling, and they wouldn't just run uh, They voice. were using clear text. Really? No scrambling at all. The British supplied all the materials for the tabs. The Americans provided the tunnels. Now there was another interesting sidelight on this was when they first built it, you know, they had technicians out there at the site working the equipment. Not not back in this in this warehouse in, on the US end, but actually out at the tap point, because they didn't want to have very long cables. So we wanted these technicians to be comfortable. So they heated the tunnel. Well, one American aircraft flying over looked down during a snowstorm or after a snowstorm and he saw the place is about eight feet wide where there was no snow. Directly from that, from that warehouse, it was the, uh, the terminal in the U.S. or the U.S. zone right to where the, the tap point was. After that point, out came the heaters, in came the air conditioners. So you got guys sitting there working the equipment wearing parkas and, <laughs> and mittens. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was sort of interesting trying to deal with, with this. And you know, they were sure that you know, the Russians would be in there within hours and when they, when, what happened is this, that, that part of the tunnel, right where the cables were, they didn't put anything around it because they didn't want to change the characteristics of the wire. So it was just dirt. I mean, these things hanging out like tree roots underneath there. Okay. 
You saturate the ground with water, what happens? <laughs> Into the bottom. And here's, and here's a bunch of East German and Russian soldiers and <clears throat> what's that? There was a side note on this too, that was that the Americans contacted State Department and said, you know, the other guys are now in the end of the tunnel. What are we going to do about it? And they said, well, put up a sign that says, you are entering, entering the American sector. <laughs> Have you ever seen the old signs in, in Berlin where you're leaving the American sector and, and in English and German and Russian and French and probably Swahili for all I know, but it had these big signs. So they said, okay, we'll put up the sign. Right? They knew right where the, the dividing line was. They put up the sign, hung it from the top, and they turned out all the lights in there. And the Army Security Agency brought in a machine gun. Wasn't loaded, but there was a machine gun in there. And so here come the East Germans and Russians down into the hole, down the ladder, and coming across. It's pitch dark. You got you know these cheap flashlights that got one candle power. And they're walking in there, and the Americans just pull the slide back on the machine gun and let it sop forward. Now any military man knows that sound. <laughs> uh, they said the guys came out of the other end of that tunnel like. ICBMs out of tunnels, straight up and out. They didn't know the gun wasn't loaded. <laughs> but that, that was sort of a side note on how they, how they kept them from coming in to the American sector. So, six and a half million dollars in 1950 dollars. Uh, any of you here were a taxpayer in 1950? What would that be today? Uh, uh, it was it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars in in today's money. I, uh, it was in the, the report. I didn't write it down, write that number down, but it was it was in the hundreds of millions. But I hope those four hundred thousand calls were were good. And, uh, another thing that was mentioned in there though was each each day they had tapes from all these lines, and they take all the tapes and fly them back to, to the United States for analysis. They were still analyzing these tapes in 1964. That was, that was the quantity of information that was, was gathered by this, this operation. Wouldn't it have been a little obsolete? Uh, actually, it might be obsolete, but Anything you can decode that an opposing force is talking about can be of use, even if it's just for historical reasons. You can go look at what negotiations were going on. And by the way, when this happened, when they finally discovered it, the British initially said, we have nothing to do with it. Because the British and the Soviet Union were having a conference in England the day after that this was discovered. So the British didn't want that to be, uh, to sort of drop a monkey wrench in their negotiations. So they, they let the Americans take all the glory for this president. And they actually thought that it would, that uh, the Soviets, when they put this out, they thought, boy, this is going to be great. It's going to embarrass the Americans. It's going to embarrass everybody in the, quote, free world. What it turned out is all the newspapers in Europe and everywhere were saying, man, the Americans are really smart that they could figure out how to do this right under their noses for, for so long. So it, it actually ended up as a coup for the Americans rather than for the Russians. And especially once they found out later that the Russians at the higher echelons knew everything about it. They knew it was going on, so why, you know, it's sort of embarrassing. Oh, yeah, I knew that, but you know, I just let it happen anyhow. 
There is one, one reason I think that they would have done that though, and that is uh, if they had just, you know, right when this thing was completed, it charged over there and dug the hole up without the rain and dug it up and said, look what we found. Somebody in the U.S. or in the U.K. would have said, why did they know to go dig right there? So that could have compromised a source, their mole, and I think they considered the, uh, the value of that mole being in MI6 was much better than, or much more important than the value of lost communication. And I don't know why they didn't go encrypted on those surfaces. Yeah. And then also they could have planted false information. Uh, that's another, another thing that a lot of times is done with, with these bugs. Is, if you know a bug is in your conference room, hey, hold a conference and say all kinds of stuff that's just total bull. Yeah. Because they think this is this is choice intel, they're not gonna run it through the bull filter. They are yeah. there's six and a half million, I just figured is today's dollars about it's nearly seventy million. Seventy million? Yeah. That's a lot of million. Like I said, all these taxpayers that were paying taxes back in the 1950s, thank you. <laughs> okay, when you, we talked about how they did these, you know, put these bugs into buildings, you know, I don't know, ship them in in a, in a, uh, basket for the bunch of flowers for the ambassador or whatever. But back in these days, we didn't have the super microchips and everything that, that will run off of a hearing aid battery for six years or whatever. So they had to come up with ways to power them. The quickest and easiest way is to tap it into the AC wiring, you know, another, another power cord plugged into this outlet on the wall. Uh, also, they used inductive coupling. They come up with ways to put a picture on the wall or something on a piece of furniture that was close to an AC line and inductively coupled. They didn't re they really need a lot of power, but they needed some. Another one was a normal AC cord to a cover device, whatever, you know, your floor lamp or your uh, some other piece of equipment in the conference room. So they, of course, you could also put a battery in it, but then you've got to be able to get back in to replace the battery. So that was pretty much a last resort method. And the big thing that was used starting in the 50s was this remote power via RF. As I mentioned earlier, with the, with the great seal, they aim high power microwave beam and it gives it enough power to operate yeah. and to retransmit the signal. And this was another, I really was surprised about this. This guy, Winfried Koch at RCA. Koch. Koch. Koch, is that it? Koch. Yeah, anyhow, in 1938, he filed a, for a patent it was granted in 1941 for this resonant cavity microphone. But the United States, in our you know, great uh, you know, openness, we're going to put all this information out there where everybody can read it. I'm sure there was somebody in the Soviet Union that could read English and was technically competent and found this information and said, gee, I think we're going to use this. And it turns out their, uh, their uh, microphones were much better than the ones the United States was building and much better than the Dutch were building. Because once they found this microphone in the Great Seal, of course, you know, this thing got dissected every way from, you can imagine to find out how it worked and what they were doing. So they were very technically advanced people building this stuff. So, I thought it was 
it was sort of an interesting thing that, you know, we're dealing with uh, something that could be used for espionage, and, you know, we published the information for the world to see. And they saw it. Anybody got any questions? Anybody got any answers? <laughs> well, I was curious. You said that something about Watergate, but I don't think you told us what kind of bugs they used at Watergate. Uh, <clears throat> they were attempting to bug the Democratic headquarters. Uh, I don't think that they ever were successful at it. Oh. They, there were two two things they wanted to. They wanted to get into essentially classified files of the, of the Democratic Party, but they also wanted to put uh, bugs in there so that they could listen to what's going on. As, as we all know, they're a pretty clumsy addict. You should have hired a pro. Hmm? Yes, sir. Um, did this thing uh, like generate a harmonic or something? So you were listening on a different frequency than you're transmitting on? Uh, what they did is they pulsed the microwave signal mm -hmm. and listened for a response on the same frequency. Uh, and then later on they came up with ones where the, the power went in on the one microwave frequency and it returned a signal on another frequency. And then they started getting really funny with things like, you know, if you're going to tuning through the frequency is using one of these uh, spy detectors and you hear just a dead carrier you know you figure it's it's benign it's just you know something sending out a signal what they did was they put the signal on a subcarrier so you had say it was 1.5 gigahertz they would use a subcarrier of 100 kilohertz, this was one of the examples they used, 100 kilohertz, and then put the audio on that subcarrier. So if you actually listen to the carrier frequency, you didn't hear anything. You had to go listen to the subcarrier and uh, filter that out to get the intelligence back. So mm -hmm. these things were also, uh, you mentioned transmitters that were powered by AC mm -hmm. or batteries. <clears throat> or something. This is just after the transistor was invented. Mm -hmm. Were these things vacuum tube? Or uh, a lot of it was vacuum tube. <laughs> very, very small vacuum tubes. Yeah, good luck capacitively powering that. <laughs> it's hard to power that off of capacitive coupling off a 60 hertz or 50 hertz line. Uh, actually, they come up with ways to make them to uh, generate high voltage. Uh -huh. uh, didn't get into anything on that. Uh, my my research would have to go somewhere, you know, somewhat further to find out exactly how they did it. It just said that there's a, there's a couple of sites. Uh, uh, one of them's called the Crypto Museum, and they've got all kinds of stuff. They, they even have one of these suitcases, and it uh, it's really interesting to see some of the stuff they've that they have acquired. Uh, I wonder how they acquired it. How much power did how much RF power did you have to hit that resonant cavity with? I mean, you know, if you were through effective radiated power in the kilowatts. Wow. But in a very narrow beam. Right through the ambassador's head. Say again? Mm -hmm. Right through the ambassador's head. Yeah, well, uh, you know. <laughs> There are you know, several things you want to do here. <laughs> but they, uh, I think they aimed it away, enough away from them that people wouldn't detect anything. There's companies that sell just about anything uh, online. You know, if, you, if you want to buy a, a TV camera that's the size of a pencil lead, and can look through a, a hole that is one thirty-second of an inch diameter. They're out there. It all depends on how fat your wallet is.
Anyhow, back in when they were doing all this stuff, we got to remember that during this time period, there was very little RF actually out there. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have Wi-Fi. We didn't have, in most cases, a lot of stuff is television was still new. So you just had, yes, sir. It's one thing they did have. They had very powerful AM radio stations, which, by the way, with a loop stick, you probably could have powered this. Uh, that was something that was looked at, but the problem was uh, an, an antenna that would couple enough of a power to, to run one. And I don't think a loop stick's actually pretty inefficient as an antenna. That's why they have 50,000 watt broadcast stations. Yeah, Radio Shack used to have a kit where you could cover things with a loop stick. Mm -hmm. Are there any Radio Shacks left? No, I, I think, how many times have they gone bankrupt and then they, they play Resurrect from the Dead and then they're bankrupt again? But they, uh, yeah, there's... They also they had things like a telephone if you have a telephone in there, you know, you figure when you got the phone hung up, that the phone won't pick up anything. But they found that if you send a signal at an ultrasonic frequency down the telephone line, that it will excite the carbon microphone that's in the phone and send out enough of a signal to come back down the same telephone line. And you can sit there and listen to this, the audio out of the room. Because when you hang up a phone, it actually disconnects the uh, earpiece and the microphone. Unless you can rewire, there's ways you can rewire the phone to make the microphone hot, but to do that, you've got to get into where the phone is. So they, they were doing things like, you know, sending power down the lines. Uh, you know, at a later time, they were actually looking at the vibrations on windows to listen to the audio going on inside the room. So the counter counterintelligence portion of that was they put little transducers on all the windows and sit there sending various tones through there to obliterate that capability. Now they've got one using a laser that can detect the vibrations on a potato chip bag. So if you, had, you got your, you know, your snacks on, on the table during your conference, they can listen to the vibrations from that, from the, from the laser, reflected laser signal. Sort of a neat setup. And since that's, that's already published, I'm sure that that, to them, is obsolete technology. We don't know what they're doing now. They might be, might be sending signals into the fillings in your teeth to listen to the vibrations there. The, problem, the thing is, with all of this stuff, they went to uh, frequencies everywhere from a few kilohertz up to the gigahertz range. So if you're the guy that has to find these signals, you've got to start at you know, 10 kilohertz or 5 kilohertz, work your way up to 2 gigahertz. Now that's real easy. You haul out your, your little uh, SDR radio, hook it up to your, your uh, tablet computer, and you walk around and look at the signal. Of course, by this time in the, in the world, it's more of a noise ceiling than a noise floor. You have to have a pretty strong signal to get out of anywhere. But they, uh, you know, the, the kind of stuff they had then just wouldn't work today. Of course, you also can do all the demodulation with these things, so it's, it's a whole different world today. Anyhow, these suitcases, I'm going to talk a little bit about them. There were a lot of manufacturers building these things. They had uh, black budget contracts, you know, time and materials contract. Build us this, send us a bill for whatever, whatever you used and how many hours it took you to build it. Limits? What do you mean limits? No, we're just going to... Whatever you say, we'll pay you. I never got a contract like that. And they, 
they built these things in basements and garages. They put them in uh, nondescript, they call them nondescript containers. You know, you come in there carrying your Pelican case or your, your old Halliburton Zero case or something like that, walking into an embassy, they go, hmm, I know what that guy's going to do. But if you go in there carrying a suitcase that looks like it's just been drugged from China to New York, why, yeah, it's just some guy seeking asylum. And the other way they got him in is diplomatic pouch. People talk about diplomatic pouch as a pouch, a, a briefcase. I've seen them that are diplomatic crates. You know, come in on a flatbed and haul them into an embassy somewhere. And so a, a diplomatic pouch, the only thing it, that means is that it's not subject to inspection by whatever country it's in. Because it's not in their country. It's going into U.S. territory. So. And F.G. Mason, this guy, he is, he's a pretty interesting guy. I've looked up some of his background. He was designing TV tuners when TV was in its infancy. Designing, anybody remember the old plunk tuners? Yep, he, he designed a lot of that stuff. And then he saw the light. You know, they say, you see the light, there's money to be made. So he moved his work over into people, uh, into government work, time and materials contract. And this, these receivers, you know, the old receiver is anything from 25 pounds on up. Anything all the way up to crush your desk. And most of them would just cover a couple of octaves. Yeah, 1.8 to 30. Or 28 to 150, whatever. So, you'd have to have a lot of these 25 pound plus receivers to cover the band. And I'd really be suspicious if you walk in and tuck one of them under each arm. Actually, if you come in carrying a bunch of these things, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> but they needed to cover the range from two kilos, uh, kilocycles, two gigacycles. Hertz hadn't been invented yet. They were probably, probably uh, renting cars, but... <laughs> They weren't describing frequencies. And it had a spectrum analyzer in it. In that era, a spectrum analyzer was... So, and fairly simple to operate. So we had... By the way, this guy ended up going bankrupt. He actually got caught in a kickback scandal selling these units, or a later version of these units, to the German government. And he was getting kickbacks from the guy, or paying kickbacks to a guy in, who was like the purchasing guy in Germany. So he got hauled in and ended up declaring bankruptcy and closing his doors. Got greedy. Before we start looking at the, the actual unit, there's a picture, you've seen that picture on, on the sign. But he also, and these other companies, invented other equipment. Telephone line test sets. Something to de detect capacitively tapped phone lines. They measured balance on the lines, and they constantly monitor the lines, and if all of a sudden, boop, you had some kind of a in inconsistency on your line, or some kind of glitch, you know, it was time to go, you know, look, down, look for mudslides and see what's down there. And they also made jammers, like white noise generators that the audio range, Tapes with, with 
with chatter. And they come up with all kinds of ways to shield things, including completely shielding a room, two layers of shielding, uh, independently grounded. It's really nice stuff. But yeah, this, uh, some of this equipment was interesting. They had, they had one of them uh, that I read about. It's called a nonlinear junction detector. And it'll detect a bug that is not in use. What it does is puts a field out and activates the bug. It looks sort of like a, uh, a metal detector. You can run it over walls and concrete pillars in your house or whatever, and build it all up. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Again, it's just how much money do you want to spend? Now, how about, how do you find a bug? If you think you got a bug in your house or in your office or whatever, they say the first thing to look for is an out of place item. Yeah. You know, suddenly a uh, unusual book shows up on your bookshelf, or something has been moved from its previous position, things like that, that they look for. If somebody's going to go in and do a scan, this is the first thing they look for out of place items, uh, unusual items. And then you kind of scan from DC to daylight. Like I said, now it's not much of a problem. You've got the, you got these little SDR receivers. You just hook them up and let them run. Store all the information in your computer until the your hard drive is bulging, and then go back and look at it. And you've got you got to look at signals going out, and signals coming in. Thing up in the air, see if that microwave signal at one and a half gigahertz is coming in there, destroying you. So. And they also say today you look for IR, infrared, and laser beams. Now, how are you going to look for something that's infrared when you can't see it? Is the camera in your cell phone works really good. It, it spots a lot of stuff. It's something everybody already has in their hands, so you can use that. Uh, if you expect uh, or suspect a video surveillance, you get a really bright flashlight, a real narrow beam, and just swing it around the room. You'll get a reflection anywhere that there's a lens. Even a very small lens. If you've got a bright flashlight, you'll see a flash of light from that lens. So. And another trick. And there, if you ever, if you ever really interested in this, go online. And there are companies that tell you all kinds of things to do, and of course they're all hawking their own equipment. For only two thousand dollars, you can get this piece of equipment that was built up out of surplus Radio Shack parts, and it's probably illegal to have. <laughs> I found out they have. They have cell phone jammers, a little square box about that high. They'll jam anything within 100 feet. Cell phones won't work. And they're not legal. Hmm? And they're not legal. They are not legal. No. The only one that's allowed to do any jamming is certain portions of the government. <coughs> Police departments aren't allowed to because they, and, uh, in prisons they had problems because they wanted to put jammers in prisons so that prisoners couldn't look, couldn't use a, a counterbad cell phone to negotiate their next escape. FCC come down and said, no, you don't do that. It's probably done anyhow. Anyhow, that's all. Anybody got any more questions? If not, I, we can pull this thing out of the box and you can see 1950s technology. Do you, do you know what the receiver technology was? Is it super hot? Uh, what, what kind of receivers they did? Or what kind of what? What kind of receivers they were using to do all this? Was it a fairly sophisticated? How's it different from a communications receiver? 
Uh, well, the normal communications receiver, you're going to be looking at uh, something that, in, that, in this area that's not miniaturized. Yeah. And by the way, this thing no longer works for one reason. It uses mercury batteries. All you got to do is mention the word mercury with batteries and they're going to take you out in handcuffs. Here's the, ba the base main unit. This is the, the IF, the receiver, and this is the spectrum analyzer. I don't know that it's very well calibrated. There's not, no markings on it other than a green screen filter. But 